I want to welcome all of you to our service today on this June the 14th, almost the uh, beginning of summer. So thank you for joining us. We're happy to welcome you. We all heard some encouraging news this week from the government of Ontario that uh, worship places could be open again with uh, strict protocols, of course. Uh, but many of our denominations, including Anglican, Lutheran, United, and uh, even our Presbyterian congregations, um, were a little less enthusiastic about that. Uh, we have many, many seniors in our congregations, and we felt that those vulnerable people would be uh, tested by such a gathering. So uh, the session at West Flamborough met this past week, and we agreed together that we would remain, our building would remain closed for worship uh, until the fall. Uh, no specific date in the fall, but we'll just uh, see how things develop over the summer. And perhaps by September, things will have become a little easier to do what we hope we can do, which is open again. So we left that date open for now. So while our building will be closed for worship gatherings um, for the immediate future, we continue to meet weekly through this medium and we continue to post these pre-recorded services to our Facebook and our YouTube pages so that you can join us in prayer and listen again to God's word and reflect with us on the word for each, for each of us each week. And also this past week, we concluded our study of the book of Revelation that we've been following for the past three months. Uh, we've been meeting through Zoom, about a dozen of us, and I think we've, we've all found it a rewarding experience uh, in our faith and our understanding, particularly of this book, a difficult book, but we got through it with the uh, a lot of work and reading and uh, connecting to Old Testament passages. So it's been a, I think, a helpful experience for all of us. And we will continue to pray that God will lead us into what may be some future studies. And uh, I'll keep you posted on and welcome any suggestions you might have for that in the future. Uh, during the prayer time today, um, there will be an opportunity to name people you want to remember in the silence uh, you have on your minds and hearts. Uh, we would like to remember today uh, two families, uh, Woody Thompson and Gwen. Woody, I believe, is home from the hospital now, thankfully, and uh, recuperating at home, so we pray for him and Gwen, and also for Walter, and Marg Reed, Walter remains in the hospital, uh, undergoing further tests with uh, the doctors there, so we pray for them. In our prayers at the session this week, we celebrated uh, Shauna and Ian's 40th wedding anniversary, so we, well, we celebrate with them, pray for them. And we also remember Emma's daughter who works in a, I think, in a long-term care facility, and one of the workers tested positive for COVID, and so she was being tested, I believe, yesterday. So we'll pray for that family as well. So let's join together in our prayers after we reflect on God's Word. Today we're going to continue our series of sermons on the basics of the faith, and I've chosen this week to reflect on the Bible and its place in our lives, our spiritual lives. So let's open together in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to gather together, to, re to pray together, to reflect on this word that you have for us today, and that your spirit will open our hearts and our minds to receive the word for us. And we continue to pray that you will bless your congregations in our presbytery. We think of our own congregation at West Flamborough and pray for each one of the families that they may be safe, that you will keep them under your care, 
and that we in the pastoral care team and others in the congregation will continue to connect with each one during this time of separation. So we pray, Lord, now that you will help us as we hear your word again, that we might understand it and apply it to our lives. Through Christ our Lord. Our reading today comes from the second letter of Peter, uh, the very first chapter, it's verses 16 through 21. We, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, whom, with whom I am well pleased. Those are the words you remember at the baptism. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain, during the transfiguration, of course. So he goes on, so we have this prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will but men and women, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> so I'm calling this the basics of the faith, the Bible. I don't know if uh, children in Hamilton, in Canada, received the Bible that we all got in Britain in 1953 when the, when the Queen was crowned. And uh, here's a copy of it. This is the Bible that we all received, every, every child received. And on the front it says, Elizabeth R. with a crown, Coronation, June 1953. At the back of this particular version we got in Scotland is... Um, Right after the book of Revelation, there is a section for the Scottish Church of the Psalms in Meter, the Psalms of David in Meter, approved by work for worship in the Church of Scotland. So in this little book, you'll notice the, it's a very small book and the print is exceedingly small that I would frankly not be able to read it now, but maybe when I was 11, 10 or 11 years old, maybe I could, I don't know. I don't remember actually ever reading from that text. But I do remember as a boy, uh, I still remember sitting in my bed, um, my window faced the North Sea so I could see the sea in the distance. And I remember sitting there in my bed reading the first few chapters of Genesis. For some reason, I was really intrigued and captivated by the majesty and the wonder of this amazing creation. But that's my one and only memory of ever reading the Bible as a young person. As a, not until years later as a teenager when I would again read it. Now as a mature student of the Bible, I've discovered that it's uh, an amazing collection of books. Poems, letters, gospels, quite a, ver a variety of readings. And our Bible contains many literary genres written by many different authors over many centuries. And yet, amazingly, presents a very unified message all the way through, in spite of all these different authors and different centuries. Some parts of it are obviously poetry and songs of worship <clears throat> for the psalm, like the Psalms, for example. And a few are 
highly symbolic, apocalyptic um, types of literature that you will find in some of the prophets, like Daniel. Others are like histories that we have of Israel, like the Kings and Chronicles, Samuel, um, and of course the Gospels, which are unique in themselves, and then followed by all of these letters, particularly from Paul, uh, which ends with the final letter of the, of the Bible that we have, which is the letter to the churches in, seven churches in Asia called the Book of Revelation. All of which, we have to quickly say, is not perfect. Perfect in the sense that there is nothing mistaken or incorrect or not exaggerated in those books. As Barbara Brown Taylor points out in her collection of sermons, The, Preacher, the Preaching Life, she, Barbara Brown Taylor was a, is a very, very well-known preacher in the United States, and is, I've actually heard her when she came to speak at McMaster University many years ago. She says, any serious study will soon discover human, human foot, fingerprints all over the place when you come to the Bible. And yet, in spite of those human fingerprints and all that that implies, God has been pleased to speak through its pages, through its words, over all these centuries. These imperfect human beings who wrote out, their, out of their experience, out of their limited time frame, and yet, miraculously, guided by the Spirit, gave us this word from God. So if we listen to some of what the Bible says about itself, we get this message. Poets, singers, historians, moralists, visionaries, prophets, they all speak with the same voice about God who inspired them. Prophets never stop saying that the word of God will never cease from speaking. It is a word that reaches down to us through the centuries with incredible power and relevance. Listen to the, for example, words from the prophet Isaiah. Speaking as if God were speaking through him. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, God is saying. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then we have Jesus in the gospel saying, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. In response to Jesus' question about whether or not they, will, they too will leave him, that is the disciples, Peter says, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And then in the book of Hebrews, that famous passage, we read, we read this. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but we all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Hebrews 4, verse 12. So the Bible has this amazing ability to reach into our hearts and minds and transform us. It can speak to us in fresh, and arresting ways to me every time I pick it up. If I were to go back to other ancient books, not even as ancient as some of these Old Testament books, such as classic texts on medicine or cosmology or physics that we find from the ancient world, we would enter a world that is easily recognizable as outdated and severely limited in its relevance to us today. But not the Bible. In spite of its age, in spite of it goes back even further back than some of these ancient texts, 
It continues to speak to me in a language that opens me up, that speaks to me relevantly and offers moral and spiritual guidance, even in the 21st century. Amazing. And however familiar I might become or think I am with certain passages in that, in that book, whenever I return to these same passages, I discover that they have grown in my absence, that they are saying something entirely new to me in whenever it is I'm picking it up to read. It directly speaks to what, I, what I'm feeling and, and facing at that moment. So God speaks to us through these ancient human writings in ways that no other writing does. This Bible, as we read, is a living word. And surely this is Peter's point when he responds to Jesus that he alone, Jesus, has the words of eternal life. No other man has ever spoken like this man. No other speech had the power to make Peter and the disciples and us feel so alive to God. And this is the point of this reading from 2 Peter. We are told that because these writings were so authoritative, we ought to heed them, that we need to be attentive to this biblical tradition. It's like a lamp shining in a dark place. None of these writings, Peter tells us, come about in the usual fashion. They were not the result of some cunningly devised fables born in some people's minds. No, these writings have authority and power because God has chosen to speak through these human writers. These writings are so inspired by God's Spirit, Peter is asking us, telling us, that although the product of human hands, they are the means through which God chooses to speak to us. In these books, God walks toward us and seeks to enter into relationship with us. This is the heart of the Bible. It is the story of God seeking to draw us to himself. Now, while our sins often keep us away from that Bible, it is often merely neglect that keeps us distant. I chuckled when I read Kathleen Morris's section of the, on the Bible in her collection of essays in her book, Amazing Grace. She and her husband had met an old time, an old timer in the Dakotas where she had come from and whose grandparents had been dirt poor immigrants who homesteaded in South Dakota. Their early years were hard as they sought to eke out a living from the soil, but they prospered and eventually had a large ranch. The grandfather got where he was by being very careful with his money, making as much as possible and spending as little as possible. Must have been from Scotland. The son of this man told Kathleen that he'd faced a crisis in his life with cancer. And out of the blue, he told them about his religious grandfather who'd given him and his bride a, a Bible, a wedding present. And it was bound in white leather with their names and dates of the wedding on it in gold letters. And he told them they left it in the box and it ended up in the bedroom closet where it had remained for years and years. And every time they saw Grandpa, he, he would ask them whether or not they had liked the Bible that he had given them. Well, years later, his curiosity got the better of him, and so he got down the box and opened it. And to his amazement, he found a $20 bill at the first chapter of Genesis and discovered a $20 bill in every new book of that Bible amounting to $1,300, which at that time was a significant amount of money. 
So I guess the grandpa got the last joke, the last word. And I'm sure each of us can talk about how we have drifted away from reading scripture. I remember myself after two or three years of enthusiastically following Christ and attending church and attending study groups and reading my Bible, I gradually found myself drifting away from church, drifting away from Bible reading and moved in different circles, I think. That's why it started gradually. Uh, started associating more with people at work who were very little interested in the life of faith more, more and more, and they became my companions. And I remember one day sitting at my desk in the basement where I lived, and I suddenly realized the Bible that was sitting off to the side that I had been passionately reading and studying just a few years before was now a closed book to me. And my memory of that feeling is still vivid for me. It's kind of emptiness and loss. And it would take a crisis in my life to bring me back to the faith, to back to reading that book. I think once we drift imperceptibly away from the Bible and away from church attendance, away from Christian fellowship, it's just amazing how, how easy it is to lose touch with the life of faith, with church and scripture. If it happened to me, I'm sure it's happened to many of you too. And at that point in our lives, the Bible does become like a dead book, a dead letter to us. So what is it about the Bible that makes it living and fresh if we take time to consult it. As Barbara Brown Taylor suggests, the Bible informs me that my odd little life is not just the haphazard result of evolution, but rather the loving purpose of God the Creator. It reminds me again and again as I read this Bible, it reminds me that I'm not an orphan, that I am loved, and I'm connected by faith to a community and a history that makes me part of a larger story, a larger story than the one restricted to my immediate family and social circle. I find also that I'm connected to a future vision of life that God is preparing for us. And so through this word, God continues to call us back. The Bible, in other words, is alive and fresh and always relevant because its stories and poems and histories and laments and prophecies and gospels and letters, they all seek to plug me into the living story that has been going on since the Garden of Eden. It seeks to connect my story and your story, messy and limited those stories might be and frustrating at times as well, to connect that story of us with the larger story of God's loving plan for the human family. The Bible speaks to me and you about a God who enters into covenant with us through our great, great, great grandfather Abraham, who leads us step by step toward a God who comes and lives and dies for us. So you and I are part of that big story. That's what's so amazing about this book. It connects us to a story bigger than us. And it's not a story about a distant, remote being. This God of the Bible can become incredibly intimate and close. He is immersed in our earthly existence. He comes to Moses and he asks him to take off his shoes because where he stands is holy ground. The Bible's not a book about a disembodied deity who speaks to us in philosophical couplets. This God of the Bible comes down to us, enters our world of dust and deceit and death. We don't have to become angelic 
or leave our bodies and human passions behind when we enter the world of the Bible, God comes to us through a burning bush, through a great wind, through a pillar and of fire and of cloud and is still a small voice, a dove, a newborn baby. The sacred and the secular are not separated in the Bible. They're intertwined. It's commonplace to think that entering the holy place demands some kind of physical striptease act. We imagine that to be in God's presence we have to become something less than we are. Any reading of the Bible should dispel any such notion. God is encountered in the midst of the ordinariness of our lives, in the midst of our flawed human condition, but remembering and reminding us that we're created in God's image. No, the Bible is not populated by perfect people. They are sinners just like you and me. People who wrote these books were just like you and me. They're amazingly just like you and me. Imperfect sinners who often do the most absurd things. Noah gets drunk. Abraham lies. Sarah mocks. Jacob cheats and deceives. David kills and commits adultery. Disciples run when things get difficult and threatening. And apostles argue over how the church should go, how it should grow. Paul and Barnabas disagreed so hard that they separated and couldn't work with one another again. Nor is God conventional. This God, we're told, is a consuming fire, a bringer of judgment, and a voice that will not be silenced. God is the sovereign one who is holy. But also God's love is a holy fire, and that God will never give up on a rebellious creation. God will die for it. So in Jesus, we hear and see how we ought to live. In him, the future is mapped out for all of us to see. This is the story spelled out in living color through the dramatic history of the Jewish people and reaches its climax in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord. So to be connected to this amazing story over these many, many books of the Bible is to be alive to my past and your past, my present and your present, and my future and your future. And to ignore this book is to miss the very point of why I'm here and where I'm going. So this is why the Bible is so central in our lives. Because God continues to speak to us through its stories and poems and songs and gospels and letters. May this word continue to awaken in each one of us, awaken love for God and our neighbor. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the silence, we have an opportunity to remember those families that we have mentioned that are needing the healing of God, who are needing patience and grace. So we pray now for, uh, for each one of these families. We think of the Thompson family and the Reed family 
And there may be others that you want to remember, so let us go to prayer now. Gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do thank you for your word, which is a, it's able to make us alive to you and to salvation, that has spoken to us many, many times over our lives and continues to speak to us of your love for us, reminds us of the great story that is told within it and connects us to that great story. Thank you for that gift. We pray for the folks at West Flamborough today, especially. We remember the congregation at West Flamborough, many of whom are in long-term care facilities and nursing homes that we've been unable to visit. We're thankful we can talk to them through a telephone, we can reach them through the internet when possible. We thank you for the pastoral care team that have been reaching out and other members of our congregation who have been visiting and dropping off letters and sermons to people who have no connection. Thank you for the, the gift of these people and for their love for your people. Today we remember in the silence, we remember Walter and we remember Marg, and we think of Woody and Gwen, and we ask you to be with them that your healing presence will be with them. In the silence, we bring to you the names of those that we are thinking about right now that need your prayer, that need our prayers. All these prayers, Father, we offer to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Now may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.